things through the Bible. He's, uh, Jesus used to speak in parables to help folks understand. But from the beginning of time on, from the beginning of this Bible, we can see many ways that God tries to teach us about our relationship with Him. About how we should act, about uh, the way the mannerisms that we should take, and how we should devote our heart and our lives to Him. Uh, from the shepherd to the sheep, He shows how that he is, uh, the shepherd would protect and provide for the sheep that he's instead in charge of. He tells how the, the shepherd would lay at the gate. And no matter what would come up, he would protect that sheep or those sheep with his life. He shows from the, uh, from the husband and the wife, the spouse, the bride, the groom, how that the love <coughs> should be there and how they should treat one another. How that the, uh, you know, they should, uh, as the Bible says, <coughs> become as one. And they should do one for another, not try to hinder, not try to, uh, how shall we say, tear down or to bring chaos in, but to bring love in and share through love. Also for a father and his children. A big thing is, you know, we see through the Bible as how God represents a relationship as a father and a child. And for those of you <coughs> who are blessed, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> with children, you know that there is nothing that you wouldn't do for your child, period. You would do whatever you could, whatever it took, uh, no matter if it was to break the bank or to break your back or to break your neck, to do whatever it took. You would do what you could do for your children, for your child. It's just, it's the love that's instilled within us. <clears throat> I'll give you an example, perfect time for it. For the past, oh, I don't know, four weeks, you know, Colton has been, I mean, you know, my son's been up at, at Young Harris, stuck up at his college campus. Because we were thinking that, okay, there's a tire issue with this car. But they, okay, got this flat tire. So I tell him, hey, go over here to the store. You know, if you have to, and I'm definitely not preaching for it or against it, but if you have to, put a can of Fix-A-Flat in to get it to the store. Tell them that you've got Fix-A-Flat in it because they sure hate when the stuff comes in. But then that way they can get the tire set up, they can get it cleaned up, you can get the tire fixed, and you will be able to come home. Everything just kept coming up. He's got a super busy schedule, hopefully his last semester here at school. And every time he would try something, it wouldn't work. So we drove up a couple weeks ago. I'll just go up there and get this for you. Right before we went up, he finally, I was talking to him on the phone, he finally gets it to where... Uh, he takes it to one store, and they're like, oh, there's nothing wrong with your tire. There's nothing wrong with them. Like, there's got to be something wrong. This was a firestone up in North Carolina. There's nothing wrong. It's just whatever. You know, they just fussed about him about to fix the flat. So finally, I said, take it to a little mom and pop shop. Take it to a little tire store, and they'll be able to figure out what's going on. What he got there, and it was, of course, worst case scenario. Nothing was wrong with the tire. It was the rim. The rim was cracked. So I'm like, all right. So I call around, find some stores up there, these old aluminum wheels, and we start pricing, pricing different things. Well, of course, for a new rim, 160 plus bucks, you know. Or I found a guy or a store up there that would weld the rim. They had somebody get up that could weld it, and he'd say anywhere from 30 to 60 bucks, according to how bad it is, how long it's going to take me. So I said, all right. So. Anyways, Colton, this is going to end up being over half a day thing because you have to take it from, take the tire off, take it to one store, they have to break it down, then you have to take it up to the guy who welds it, and then they have to, he has to do the welding, then it has to go back to the tire store, they have to put it back together, so it was a long process. Well, he's in class all day, and of course, guess what? They're closed. So, another road trip took place earlier this week. Here we go, back up towards, you know, three hours away, back up to Young Harris, and I get up there. Take it to the tire store. Well, actually, had, had some great trouble. Get up there in the car and now it's gone so flat that I can't get the jack under it. You know, it's just one thing after another. These nice, low-profile tires and these lowered cars that all the kids have now. I told myself, man, when I was young, everybody wanted the cars and trucks up here. You know, now y'all can't, you can't even get under them anymore. So anyway, so I had to go to the police station, which is on campus, so we got air compressors. Finally got enough air to get the jack under it. Get it, take the tire to the place, they break it down. And I'm like, oh no. I was thinking about a crack, yeah, but there was a, it was cracked all the way out to the edge of the rim. And it was at least an inch and a quarter long. 
going out to the edge, cracked off the edge, come down through, come back up. A lot of contours that it's followed. I'm sitting thinking, oh my goodness. And the guy at the tire store, he's like, well, the guy over there, Doug, he's pretty good. He should be able to get this. He's done 40 to 50 of them for us. Ain't never had a problem yet. So, yep. Then he's looking and he goes, yeah, he'll probably be able to get it. And I was like, great, probably. You know, what am I up to now? So, anyway, so we take the wheel up there to Doug. We show Doug, and Doug gets to looking. And I'm still not hearing the confidence that I'm wanting to hear. Yeah, yeah, that's a good crack right there. And I'm thinking, great, you know. So what Doug has to do is Doug has to, he has to clean it all up. He goes through the process of telling me. Now, here I am. I'm not a, a welder. I especially, you know, especially, you know, Eric, you might could, could testify. But he's sitting there having to, to get a hold of this aluminum wheel. And he says, I got to do it two different ways. I got to clean it all up, cut it up. I got to go to the inside, weld it from the, from the inside and from the inside and the back side. He said, then I've got to come back from the top and cut it back in pretty deep and go back into my other weld. To make sure that it's going to stay. And I'm sitting there thinking, all right, buddy, you do that, you know. We're not speaking exactly the same language. I got an idea. And he said, tell me, you know what happens is all of these new tires, these low profiles, these nice light aluminum wheels, they look great. And whoever's got them, boy, you know, they're stylish. You know, they're profile. You know, they're out there. They're the, the, they make the cars just look good. But from good looks and to be able to fit in with everybody, you also suffer some of the stuff that you really need. He said, look here how you only got these couple of spokes that are out here on the outside edge for everybody to see. But over here on the inside of these big old wide wheels, there's no support. The inside's got nothing there. And every time he hits a pothole or every time he goes over a curb, Especially if he's going a little bit of speed, because there ain't much tire no more either. You know, you used to hear again, just much rubber between the rim and all the way around. Now what you got this? There's no protection. You know? And it just cracks. He said, now I can tell you, if we can fix, I can fix this up, but if it keeps going and if it keeps hitting more potholes, chances are it's going to crack over here and over here because there's just not the support needed in this kind of rim to handle the, how shall we say, the greatness of our roads that we have out there. There's just not enough there to handle it. <clears throat> so I'm sitting there thinking, great. Right now i got this situation going. He's going to hopefully be able to fix it. But I'm always knowing that this kind of stuff could happen again, right? You know, our lives are the same way. I got to thinking about that. I'm like, wow. This morning I'm going to preach to our, we're going to read some scripture out of Jeremiah. Talking about how, you know, God, and it's one of the, the, perhaps probably one of the biggest examples and the biggest way that God showed just how he loves us and just how and that he ministers and keeps us. But as we look at this, I want you to imagine that you are either, number one, you can use your choice. You're either that rim or you're the piece of clay that Jeremiah talks about. In Jeremiah 18 and 1, it says, The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, Arise. And go down to the potter's house. And there I will cause thee to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house. And behold, the wrought, he wrought a work on the wheels. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again another vessel. As seemed good to the potter to make it. Then the word of the Lord come to me saying, O house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter? Saith the Lord, Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in mine, O ye house of Israel. Jeremiah gets a word. God tells him, says, I want you to go. I want you to go in here. I want you to look at something. I want to show you just how our relationship is. I want to show you how I feel for you. I want to show you how I'm moving and how I minister upon your life. <clears throat> so it says he walks down to a potter's house and he gazes in and he starts looking and he sees this potter at work. And this potter has this piece of, of clay up on, a, up on a wheel and he's making a vessel. Now, what is the main purpose that the potter is making these vessels for? That was his job. He's taking this piece of clay and he takes it and he forms it and he molds it. He spends his time on it and he makes this piece of clay into a vessel that he can use 
to benefit himself. Is that not correct? He goes out there and he makes these pots, he makes these vases, he makes these cups, and he sells it so that his pocketbook, so that his kingdom, so that his banking account can be enlarged and so that he can actually, how should we say, be able to make something and make his livelihood grow. He takes these, this, uh, this clay and he forms it into a fashion which can be used by everybody else but he forms it with his loving touch. He puts his marks upon it so that he can uh, enlarge his kingdom, so to speak. And he's telling Jeremiah, he says, this is what I want you to do. I want you to go there and just watch. Now, as Jeremiah is seeing this, the picture starts unfolding. And he starts realizing, just as this potter has this clay upon this, this wheel, this is the same way that God is doing us. God didn't just save us to put us on a shelf. Just imagine what if that potter, you wouldn't know you looked in, he makes all these vessels, and he goes and he sets it on a shelf. That never show anybody, that never let everybody use it, and he goes and he makes a plate, and he sets it on a shelf. And over and over and over and over, through the years, he's constantly makes stuff, but he's either putting it in the closet, he's either putting it in the, on a shelf in a cupboard, or he puts it somewhere and shares it with nobody. Not only is he himself not helping his own self grow, but he's helping nobody else. He's sitting there doing stuff, more or less, just to either waste his time, or nothing that can help and help everybody. So <coughs> Jeremiah is watching and he's seeing what God is trying to show him. That this potter is using the gift that God has given him to form and to make something for everybody else <coughs> to, <coughs> and to enjoy and to share with in life. God didn't just take you and save you and make you to either sit on a church pew or to sit at home or to sit it at your job. But he made you as a vessel that can be used to shine for his kingdom, that can be used for his glory, that can be used to put out there to share with others so that others can see. You ever got something that, that you just think is a great quality? Like right now, I tell you, I would actually go back and tell everybody up in that area, hey, if you need some tires and wheels worked on, I can tell you, <coughs> excuse me, I can tell you the place that you need to go if you're up around Young Harris and Blairsville. There's a place that has done quality work. There's a place that has treated me right. And that's where you should go. <coughs> if you find something, <coughs> a vessel, a piece of uh, uh, whatever. Y'all ladies ever, ever ever get certain prints on plates and, 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 uh, and all these cups and so forth or silverware. You get these certain prints and these makes and you tell everybody these are the good ones. You share it so others would want it. God wants us to share what he has made of us, what he's made of our life, so that we can share to others, and others would see what we are, what God has made of us, and that they too would want to be part of the potter's kingdom, that they too would want to come under <clears throat> God's watchful eye and God's hand and be part of God's collection. Think about it. That's kind of what we are. We're kind of like part of the collection. We're a part of, of something that the grandest potter has ever made. And we are a part. We're his pride and we're his joy. How do I know this? Because if he takes us off the wheel and once he has finished us and he's got us like he wants us, he sets us out to go. Just like in the Great Commission when he said, go you into all the world to spread the gospel, <coughs> to spread his name and to spread his work. Why? To win others back to the kingdom. Let's look at that potter. He said there has to use certain tools. He has to use a shovel. He has to go out there and dig his clay up. Now it isn't just he goes to the, to the local store <coughs> down the Hobby Lobby or whatever and buys some, but he has to go put the work in himself. And he goes and he digs the clay. And then it isn't just all of a sudden that he can use this clay. The clay itself has to go through a process to where he beats it, he bangs it, he dries it, he wets it. He uses seawater uh, to get the sludge across it. After weeks and weeks of preparation, he can finally use what he has dug up, the raw material. God does the same thing with us. He finds us. The Holy Spirit calls out to us. He draws us to him, right? But we're not this perfect example yet. 
We are the raw materials. But God starts touching. And God starts talking to us. The next thing you know, we draw to him. Yes, God, we want to be put upon that wheel. Change my heart. Change my life. Let me be as you would have me to be. So God puts us up there. But there's a process that we have to go through as we're being molded and as we're being made. You know, one of the things that they have to do, which, you know, I guess it makes sense if you, if you know what you're doing, they have to take that big old thing of clay <coughs> and they have to smash it with a hammer. And he smashes and he smashes to make sure all the air bubbles are out. Because you ever seen something that had a chip in it or a big old hole in it? You know, that's because the, the actual clay wasn't in the best shape that it could be. There was a problem with it as it was turning or as it was churning. And it wasn't what it was as strong as it should be. Kind of like that rim on the outside. You know, there's just no support back to the inside of it. So anyway, so he goes and he looks and he says, okay, he says, I'm looking. I see how that potter takes that clay. I see the process that it takes up. And he says, but then what else does he do? He says, he puts it on this table and he sits down there's a big old wheel. Then he can kick with his foot and push. There's a stick that goes up with another wheel that he puts, his, he puts upon it. And as he's turning, that other wheel, and the, and the top one spins as well. And it says, but as he's turning and as he starts to form, <coughs> two things are always upon that clay. That's the potter's, <coughs> excuse me, his eyes <coughs> and his hands. When you are going through the things that you're going through in life, you may feel like you're running in a circle like that clay. As you're turning and you're turning, every time you turn around on something new, every time, another temptation, because every time something happens, all of a sudden you feel like, I just ain't going to make it anymore. This isn't worth it. I just don't know what I'm going to do. Just remember this. God's eyes and God's hands are always upon you. All right? And every time he sees a little something start going wrong, he takes his hands and he starts to pay that area certain attention. That's how come every time the devil comes up and he starts messing with you. There's going to be spots that he knows is going to be your downfall. He knows what your weaknesses are and there's going to be times that he comes up and starts trying to get that weakness to rise back up. He's going to try to get that weakness to start working back in. So God's eyes are going to be watching. His hands are always going to be there constantly trying to mold, constantly trying to, to get you right back to where you are supposed to be. There's folks that we know have been saved. You, know, you, hear, you can hear stories and testimonies of folks. Oh, I've been in the church. <coughs> been saved for 70 years. There's folks that's been saved for seven, seven years or seven days. But we all have got the same story that we can tell. That God has taken us from a piece of miry clay. And that God has molded us. And each one of us can say that his eyes have never left us, his hands have never left us, and he's always been there for us. Now, whether it's been seven days or 70 years, God still loves you just the same. So don't think, well, I'm a new, I'm a new Christian, you know, God does. No, God still loves you just the same. Let me show you, let me show you that. He also does this. Whenever that, that's why, he, that's why a, a Jeremiah was seeing. Jeremiah comes in, there's this piece of clay there, and he's get to work in it, and it says a spot comes up. Something happens in one spot, something went wrong. And it says that the potter actually takes it, and he remakes it back to where it can be perfected, to where it can be used. This spot that had risen up and was making its way into the final vessel had gotten so bad that the potter had to take it, crush it down, and build it back up. Sometimes in our in our life, sometimes in our Christian walk, we have things start to happen to us. And we might have been there, for, we might have been on that wheel for a while, but something starts happening. Temptations. Trials. And these bad parts start forming. Now here's the thing that gets everybody. I think, well, what happens if God just takes it and throws it away? God's not going to do that. He's done spent too much time on what he has done from you from the time that he has seen you and brought you to him until you're at this point. 
He's done put too much investment in you. He sent his son Jesus to die upon that cross for you. He's invested too much of his own love in you to just throw you away. But what he does do sometimes is flatten us back out and break us down and has to reform us one more time. Nobody likes that forming into reforming. Nobody likes to be held under the pressure or held under. But sometimes God has to, how shall we say, bring us back down, pile us back up so he can start forming and making us again. Because we allow from the inside something to come up and take away the pureness and the right form that God would have for us. So he uses his wheels. He uses a hammer. And we sit there and we start wondering, why do we have to go through such things? In 2 Corinthians, we're told this, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us far more exceeding and the eternal weight of glory. In other words, sometimes we have to go through little things in life. Sometimes we are faced with things in life that, that we, not, not, uh, we might not understand, but... God is in control. God tells us His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. So when we're going through these trials and we're going through these bad spots and all of a sudden the, uh, something within us starts changing and God has to bring us down, we might not understand it. But what we've got to understand is this. We are still up on the wheel. God is never going to take you off <clears throat> and throw you aside and go to something else until He's got you Formed at the best way that he can make you. And let me tell you this, folks. God isn't a slacker, or as you know, to put it in modern day terms, God's not a slacker that he's going to lie. God's not someone that he's going to say, you know, with this one, I'm only going to go so far. No, he's going to take the clay that is you. He knows you. He loves you. And he's going to make you the best vessel that he could be. Why would he make you any different or any, how shall we say, shorter or with less, less perfection or with less love than he made anybody else? Each one of us is a vessel that shines right back to the potter that when someone sees you, they see God, as the sign says. When someone sees you, <clears throat> do they see Jesus within you? Do they see that base and that foundation? Do they see that you've allowed God to keep his hands, that you have been the one that is pliable? If the clay continues to mess up, you finally smash it and smoosh it, you know, and you keep reforming it, and sometimes you might have to put it back and take it back from the original process and bring it right back up. God is going to keep his eyes and his hands upon you. He is going to keep working with you until you decide you don't want him to anymore. Which hopefully is not going to be anybody's decision. But God's not going to give up on you. You are his clay. You are his masterpiece. He wants you to shine. He wants you to be a thing of beauty. He wants you to be something that can be used to bring glory to his kingdom. We went down to Venezuela years and years ago on a cruise and we went to a glass blowing place and it was amazing to watch these guys they would take this you know this glass this furnace and they would roll it and twist it and roll it and twist it but and they would try to blow it out but when they would blow through these tubes and, and get these bases going up if it messed up guess what they had to do they had to put it right back in to the furnace to melt it all the way down so that they can one more time get a piece out and start rolling and start working with it to try to come up with what they wanted to be their end vessel. God is the same way with us. We might not come out the first time like he wants us to be because of something with the clay that just isn't right. So he's just going to smash us down, remake us, re-roll us, keep his hands upon us and form us in the way that he wants until we finally become pliable enough in his hands to where he can use us. You know, that's the big thing. We're our only objection. The only thing that we are supposed to do as the clay is what? Be formed. We're not supposed to say, hey, I got an idea what I want to be. That's not up to us. That's up to the potter. Hey, I want to go over here and be sold to so-and-so. To I want to be in this nice, this nice place. That's not 
not up to you. That's up to the potter. But hey, I want to be a cup. I want to be a plate. It doesn't matter what we want. Our thoughts is what God wants and it's what God intends us to be. He is the one that is the potter. We are just the clay. And if we want to be the best that we can be, we need to make sure that we make ourselves pliable, that we make ourselves usable, and that we conform to what He has for us. <coughs> In Romans, <coughs> excuse me, 12 and 1, Paul says, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. <clears throat> the only thing that we as the claim are supposed to do is to follow the potter's hands. If he starts squeezing in here, then we're to squeeze in and go where he wants us. If he's trying to open us up in this way, then we are to allow ourselves to be open so that the master's hands can touch us, so that we can become what he wants for us. He knows the greater picture. We're sitting there thinking amongst our little self, our little carnal mind, while we think when God himself, the one who created this whole universe, the one who created everything that we know in existence, is trying to create a masterpiece in us, and we're sitting there being too ornery, too mean, too stupid, or too whatever to allow his hands to make us all that we can be. And we try to put in our own two cents. If we would just transform ourselves and say, God, we want to be what you want. We know you're the potter. Put us on that wheel. Spin me again. God, I've messed up. I have I've let this impurity come in. I have let this this from the outside. I'm, I'm not what I'm supposed to be. Just like that rim I was talking about. All of a sudden now, the support from the inside, because I want to fit in. <clears throat> I want to be cool. I want to be what's the trending out there. I want to have the low profile. I want to be like everybody else. Well, that's not the strongest that you can be, because now you have cut yourself short. Now you have made it to where you can fit in out here, that you have cut down on your support to take you to where you are supposed to be. You're shortchanging your own self to try to fit in instead of letting the master, instead of letting the potter form you from the inside out and give you the strength that you need. <clears throat> Psalm says this, Search me, O God, know my heart, try me, know my thoughts, and if there be any wicked way in me, lead me in the way everlasting. God, look. Look in. Pretty much tear me apart and look in. Look through that clay. Look in there and make sure that I've not had anything hid. Look in there and make sure that there's nothing within me that's going to hinder my outcome. One time we did some uh, pottery. I don't know what it was. You know, we did some clay stuff at school one time. And I'm sitting there trying. You know, we just had these little bitty things. <coughs> 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 Excuse me. And I'm trying to make this thing up. And I'm feeling something rough. Every time I come around, very rough, 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 you know. Turned out I was a little piece of sand or grit or dirt or something. But there was something in it. Well, of course, you know, I ain't, ain't going to call on the teacher. I'm just going to say, oh, look here. I stop it. I go to pull that out. Now I got a big old hole. Right where everything was good and smooth. Now I got a big old hole. So I'm sitting there trying to, okay, I'll just smooth it over, you know. And I've got a little patch right here and I've got to put it in there, rub it didn't work. I couldn't just put a patch in it. It just wouldn't work. Teacher come by and I got this big old knot coming out, you know. What in the world? Well, I had something else. I tried to just take it out myself, you know. You can't do that. You got to smash it back down and work it right back up. Now, we try to, we try to put patches on stuff, don't we? We try to fix it ourselves. God, I can fix it. It's me. I know all about me. No, you don't. I know all about you. Trust me, you can't fix it, you know. That's why he says the most of us. I know you. I made you. You like that clay when well, you was nothing. I got you to where you are. Let me finish you up. You know, we try to patch it, but it won't work. We tried to put fix a flat in a tire. It wouldn't work. Why? Because it wasn't the tire. It was the rim. We didn't see the overall situation. So how could we fix it? 
Go back to that realm just a minute. What did that guy have to do? Man, he was telling me, I got to take it, I got to scrub it clean. Why? Wow, well, somebody put Pixify in. Oh, that was us, you know. <laughs> scrub it clean. Then I got to work on both sides. But he what he said first. He said, first, I got to work on the inside. It's the spot that nobody sees, all right? He says, but I got to go in there and I got to cut it out. Then I got to weld it back up. He said, then I got to come to the top and I got to cut it back deep and I got to weld back down into it. And this is what was crazy. You take that rim where I looked at it and I thought, man, I was amazed. He says, I have to fix it to where it'll seat back on, you know, because right up at the edge, it's got to have a lip. He said, I had to grind everything down. And I'm sitting there looking and thinking, wow. If it wasn't just because it was all new and shiny, you would never be able to see from this side what in the world was even done to it. You'd never know that there was a problem. But when you turn it up, see, upside down and you look on the inside, here was this big old weld spot. I mean, it was a big old weld. I mean, it was a beautiful weld, but here was the weld spot that you could tell. I mean, inside of us, there might be scars. There might be big old holes that's been fixed. There might be things inside there that only God himself could do. But on the outside, it's your thing of beauty. God has taken. God has changed. The inside might be all tore up and scarred, but the inside shows through to the outside. We become that beautiful vessel that God wants us to be when we allow him to do the work to us. He had to take that thing, he had to take that tire, he had to break it down, clean it, scrub it, weld it, weld, grind. It was a long process. But he didn't stop till he was done. And I'm glad to say it holds air <laughs> and it rides up and down the road in the rail. It's weighted right. It works the way it is supposed to be. Our lives, when we can look at us. If we're not allowing God's hands to form us, if we're not allowing those beautiful nail-scarred hands to touch us and sometimes mash us back down so he can bring us back up, folks, we are not what we should be. If we don't allow God to keep his hands upon us to make us, we're cutting ourselves short. As I come to the instruments, I want to read you this point. It's called the old violin. It was battered and scarred, and the auctioneer thought it would hardly worth his while to, time, to waste his time on the old violin, but he held it up with a smile. What am I bid, good people? He cried. Who starts the bidding for me? One dollar, one dollar. Do I hear two? Two dollars. Who will make it three? Three dollars once. Three dollars twice. Go in for three. But no, from the room far back, a gray-bearded man came forward and picked up the bow. Then wiping the dust from the old violin and tightening up the strings, he played a melody pure and sweet, as sweet as the angels sing. The music ceased and the auctioneer with a voice that was quiet and low said, What now am I the bid for this old violin? As he held it aloft with its bow, one thousand, one thousand, do I hear two? Two thousand, who will make it three? 3,000 once, 3,000 twice, going and gone, he said. The audience cheered, but, but some of them cried. We just don't understand. What changed its worth? Swift came to reply, the touch of the master's hand. And many a man with life out of tune, all battered and bruised with hardship, is auctioned cheap to a thoughtless crowd, much like that of the old violin. A mess of pottage, a glass of wine, and a game as he travels on. He's going once, he's going twice. He's going and he's almost gone. But the master comes and a foolish crowd never can quite understand the worth of a soul and the change that is wrought by the touch of the master's hand. Man, we may look old, we may look battered, we may have been through life. We may have so many scars on the inside that we feel like... We're so much scar tissue that we can't even be touched anymore. But God tells us, be ye transformed. I like how he changed that word. Be not conformed to the world.
but be you transformed by the word. God's tell each one of us. We're the clay. Your job is to allow me to mold you. Your job is to allow me to form you. Your job is to allow me to make you so that I can use you for my kingdom and that you can be the utmost, most beautiful vessel that you can be. But you can't do it by yourself. But once you are touched by the master's hand, once you allow his hands to form you, just like that old violin, once somebody that knows what they're doing can play can play it and make the music sound once you allow God to as the old saying goes play you like a fiddle you will finally be all you can be with him but you have to let the master touch you stand to your feet you have to allow him to make the change you have to allow him to break you down to grind you out to clean you up to put you back into the fire. Oh, nobody has to go into the fire. You know, nobody, likes to, nobody likes to be put back through the process again. But sometimes, folks, it's the only way that you can be totally changed and totally made again as God would have you if you will just allow the Master to use His handiwork upon you. Bow your heads, Father.